Um, if any of you have been to any of our other workshops, uh, we've been very fortunate to have patient advocates. Uh, as you saw in this meeting, we've had patient advocates participate uh, all the way through, either on panels or uh, at the microphone. Um, but in this particular panel, we're just really going to be devoted to the patient's perspective uh, regarding many of the issues that we've talked about today. And so um, joining us, where is Deborah? Deborah Collier <laughs> uh, is uh, uh, Sharon Terry from the Genetic Alliance. Laura Cleveland, who you met earlier, who's been a patient advocate um, affiliated with the CLGB and the Alliance. And Deborah Collier, who's been at the mic several times, who's a president and of patient advocates in research and has worked with a lot of the cooperative groups and spores. And um, I think uh, what we're in for is a very uh, good uh, discussion, uh, formal discussion from uh, Sharon and Deborah, and then we'll open it up to a general panel discussion. So I think, uh, Sharon, you're going to be first. <clears throat> Thanks very much uh, to the organizers and uh, to all of you who have stuck around to the end of today and you still we still have tomorrow. Uh, so uh, my title comes from the title that we were given, uh, but right away, um, we'll see if I can move the slides, that will be. I'm going to get rid of subject subjects and protections and call this human participant engagement. <laughs> one, one lone clapping. So I think we have a highly regulated cottage industry in uh, when we look at uh, the biomedical research enterprise. And I think we have several paths we can take. And the one that I keep seeing us take uh, is essentially the research or, or the institutional path I have here that essentially try to avoid the person. And I'm, I'm really drawing a very uh, way far end of the spectrum. Transactional, one size fits all, create the solutions based on the institution's needs. Uh, you lose engagement, you lose phenotypic information, you lose longitudinal data, you lose the ability to report. And on the other side, a participant-centric path that allows engagement, uh, is built on relationships and trust, you, where you can share all the other things that you don't want to lose over time, including um, PCOR. So from the participant point of view, I think the problem that we see, and I'm doing this, uh, the, the task was essentially to come as a patient, not to come as the general public, because I think that's a different question. But as the, as the patient or the participant, I think we've, we're seeing in lots of parts of our lives where information can be shared, where data can be moved. Uh, and as Deborah said earlier, that person doesn't understand the difference or even want a difference really between the clinical uh, services end of things and the research end. And so all of that uh, seems like it should be just as dynamic as other parts of our lives. I think from the researcher's point of view, it's often uh, con concerned that we're looking for needles in haystacks, and especially as we move towards stratified medicine, uh, more and more it's hard to find these people. And basically we wanna say the haystack is made out of needles. Every single one of us is uh, available, uh, is, is important, is part of the story that we're going to need to improve human health. And right now we engage whatever that percentage you want to use is, you know, 4% or 75% of 6% or whatever number we want to use. We engage very few people in clinical trials and in biobanks and registries. We've seen a culture shift overall, and this is one that seems somewhat shocking 10 years ago when I started talking about it, but it's really well established now. And I think a lot of times the biomedical research uh, industrial complex essentially is on the industrial side here, still looking at scarcity, looking at information that's more in a kind of material sense rather than information which is abundant, which is open, which is networked, which is hard to control the way we can control materials in the past. So I'm going to talk about the fact that I think people have vastly different views about sharing. And we've been talking about various ends of the spectrum today. We've been talking about, well, we could maybe do a, a end that where lots of people share because they should, and whether that's the collection of biosamples and surgery or whatever, or an end where nobody shares because everybody has to be asked all the time. And basically what we know is that the public uh, is all along this curve, with most of them being somewhere around this bump. Um, we could also say this is also true about um, data sharing, about privacy, about sharing in general, about access, about uh, opinions, about what should be returned or not. We have really, really wide spectrums and one size does not fit all. And we had to use one size fits all, like static consent forms, et cetera, when we were in an age that wasn't networked, that wasn't um, in, in this abundance. 
we've, we heard this this morning, and I was really glad to hear it so early in the meeting, that consent uh, cannot uh, bear the burden of the research industry. And we really have put a lot of burden on consent. I think it's crumbling. I think it's only a part of the picture. And I think we want to go to fair information practice principles more, more robustly. This slide is from the TIGER team, which is part of both the HIT um, standards committee and the, and the policy committee. I serve on the standards committee. And essentially looking at all these elements in the new, uh, in the new way that we're going to interact with individuals in medicine and the learning healthcare system makes a, a case for us not just relying on consent, especially as a form, but even just as a process. And so what we've been looking at, and I'm going to show you just this example, um, because I think it does uh, at least bring to light some of the things that I've been thinking about today as we've been listening to all the different problems and, and possibilities. We have a, a novel perspective about access to data in this project that I'm working on. We're looking at how do we make sure privacy and access are in balance. We know that most registries and biobanks, most times that we're trying to protect individuals, we could put clinical trials in here, um, are uh, coming from all sorts of centricities, whether they're, whether they're uh, physician-centric or condition-centric, uh, whether they're institutional-centric, but they're most usually focused on something other than the individual, and we're looking at what does it mean if we make this participant-centric and not just in name only. So often I hear participant-centric, and what people mean by that is we're going to invite you to the table. And I say, well, I don't actually just want to be invited to the table. I want to decide with you what is the menu and where are we going to have the meal and what color will the, the tablecloth be and who will we invite. And so more than just being invited to the table, participant-centricity, I think, is a much deeper thing. The typical registry architecture that um, I think we have been talking about today essentially puts the contact information on the outside in some kind of relationship to the inside, health data de-identified inside, and I drew genomic data here on the edge because I think they're, like we've heard all day today, there's arguments about whether it is identifiable, or whether it isn't, whether it's not like other health data, whether it is like health data. And essentially with this platform for engaging everyone responsibly, which is a project that I'm working on. We're bringing the contact information back inside, the genomic information easily back inside, because what we're essentially doing is creating a virtual database of permissible information that has privacy directives that individuals set in a granular and dynamic way. So they may change their mind over their lifespan. They may change their mind if they're diagnosed with something. They may change their mind if their next door neighbor gets diagnosed with something and they understand why they might need to share that information. So PEER, which is this platform, engaging everyone responsibly, enables granular access controls across a whole spectrum of uh, categories. And so here I have, and this is customizable, this dashboard, but I have advocacy organizations, medical researchers, and data analysis platforms, and I can fill them in with specific things like a cancer advocacy org. I can put Gail Jarvik in as my researcher that I'm working with. I can put PCORnet or Can uh, Cancer Research Network, whatever I would like in those categories in my community, because these are very much community-based in a sort of trust environment. And then in the, uh, the columns, I'm looking at who can discover me, that's de-identified information, who can have my contact information, which we do find some people are willing to share it because they want to be contacted for clinical trials, for example, um, and who can export information from this system uh, de-identified. Everyone's given the uh, option to permit, decline, or ask me. Ask me essentially becomes maybe, and you can edit these at, at any time. I've often been, uh, the pushback to me has been, that's really too hard. The average person won't understand that. It's difficult. And so what we do is we create a guide structure. And what you're looking at here are guides from our parent, uh, from our um, participant-focused drug development project that we're doing with the FDA for PDUFA-5. These are sickle cell guides from a sickle cell community in Southern Connecticut. They're recognizable to their community. And there's videos of each one of them describing their privacy settings, their ideas about sharing information, in this case with the FDA, but then of course uh, across the uh, research spectrum. We also do allow individuals to set their own uh, preferences manually. The lawyers we've worked with said you have to do that or else you're coercive. Um, you can do this for yourself or for other family members. And then we also can use the platform to send you notifications that you get in, on your computer or in your smartphone that essentially allow you to consent, deny, or uh, snooze if you don't want to deal with something uh, right away. There's an uh, audit log for everything. So we're looking at where do people come from? How do we build this in a trust community? In this case is our free the data uh, 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 initiative uh, individuals offering their BRCA1 and 2 mutations to ClinVar through this system, uh, activists who are 
working in the breast cancer community have done the videos and have invited other women uh, to set their privacy settings uh, and make those suggestions based on lower privacy concerns, moderate privacy concerns, and greater privacy concerns so that there's a variety of things. When we get to actually getting inclusion criteria for a clinical trial, or in the case of the FDA project, we're just getting opinions for the FDA around risk and benefit. We do that in a dynamic way so that individuals stay very engaged. They also get instant feedback and see how they're like everyone else and how they're different than everyone else because we have discovered that people like to be the same and like to be different. Um, so in other words, we're, we're able to give people a kind of comparison right away. They can go back and look at their answers. and this can be put into any iframe, any community, because we believe that while we want to create a global effort for individuals to feel comfortable in clinical trials and registries and biobanks, we're really looking at how, though, do you make that local? Do you build on the trust that's already in these communities? And here you're seeing citizens for quality sickle cell care, um, that we've embedded the um, platform directly into their website, looks like them, uh, they can change the buttons to say whatever they want them to say. Um, we had one group say to us, your grammar's all wrong, and they changed all the wording because they needed it to really be very relevant to their community. And the sponsors just create these dashboards using something that a sixth grader can do, uh, essentially figuring out what color should it look, have, what kind of borders, can I put badges on other websites? For example, one group put a badge on uh, Yale's website from Connecticut to get sickle cell data, uh, and then simply download the code and put it on someone else's site. So um, lots and lots more to this, 600,000 lines of code. It adjudicates all 50 state laws and, and uh, local policies like hospitals or biobanks. Um, but suffice it to say, this is our vision uh, in the future. The individual is always at the center, not theoretically, but really of their own data, uh, of their own interactions, of their own clinical trials. And so if they're the common element between all of these things and they make decisions about what data flows to what, does my gym data and device data go to my physician who's working with me on lowering uh, my cholesterol or my blood pressure? Does my pharmacy data flow to somebody else, et cetera? Um, that this kind of almost friend wheel uh, will allow me to set settings that will allow that data to flow. Um, and then finally, I'll say, uh, we've also been asked a lot about, well, what does this do with HIPAA? Well, in disseminating information about peer, and we're working with several universities, we're part of PCORnet, uh, we're working with the University of California and the University, uh, California, San Francisco and the University of Davis. Um, we, um, this information can be disseminated to their patients to help to find those needles in the haystack uh, or to uh, build uh, clinical trials because the inclusion criteria is, is preset in here because it's part of the case management of these individuals. It's providing them treatment alternatives in some cases, and so it's well within um, HIPAA and, in fact, exceeds HIPAA. Um, PEER itself is not a HIPAA-covered entity, so often run by community organizations, patient advocacy groups, in some cases hospitals or investigator networks. Um, it affords individuals a level of privacy beyond HIPAA. It holds no personal information other than what the individual says can be held, and so they, there's an explicit assent there, and reconsent and all that other stuff is quite easy. Um, and then finally, uh, a couple places it's been deployed that will be great tests to see how useful this will be uh, is the PCORnet, 10 uh, disease organizations and the two universities are using it, uh, patient-focused drug development. We've started with sickle cell. Our next two diseases are inflammatory bowel disease and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And then these last three are more generic versions, uh, campaigns that Genetic Alliance is running. And this could not be built without great expertise on the privacy and security side, Dixie Baker, uh, who has been leading the Tiger team for that, for the ONC, and then Robert Shelton, who's done a lot of the work on the um, uh, informatics side. Thank you. Since we have a little bit more time, since Laura's not presenting, I thought maybe if there were some specific questions about um, what was just presented in terms of peer, I had not heard about this before, but maybe others have. Does any, do you want to tell us maybe a little bit more about it and how it was developed? Because I don't know, did, were there people who were familiar with this or not? Okay, so could you, could okay, you spend sure. a few more minutes then? Sure, so, so basically uh, we developed it because we felt that um, the kind of blanket consent or, or consent that was 
uh, being used to try to one size fits all was not working in the kinds of systems that we saw were necessary. The other reason we developed it was because we thought that while it's important that um, individuals look through clinicaltrials.gov and try to find a, a trial, that was often very difficult for them. And so we were we wanted to develop a system whereby if enough inclusion criteria, and that's not what the individual calls it, of course, but enough personal uh, uh, health data was in a repository, in a registry, and some bio sample, biobank samples were associated with it, that the trial itself could find the individual. So right now we're working on some APIs between clinicaltrials.gov and also between um, things like the Lilly um, Innovation uh, Center to, to allow those trials to find the individual so that then they get a, a notice on their cell phone or in their, on their computer asking, uh, do you want to see if you uh, want to be, be part of this trial? Um, we also want to look at what does hypothesis generating data do if researchers can look in, uh, we have another portal that I didn't have time to show called Recruit Source. If they can go in there and say, within 50 miles, I want these kind of people who have this, and they can see, well, that's great, but that's, this isn't the best center to do it. They should do it in New York, or they should do it in California, per, uh, where the people are located, uh, that that might help both generate new ideas, but also create more easily enrolled trials. So we're looking at things like, how do we be more granular and dynamic about consent? How do we recontact easily if people are associated with each other in these systems? How do we enroll clinical trials more robustly so there are less low enrollment trials? And then how do we have the trials find the people? I'm off cue, but uh, Laura is going to speak, but without slides. So <laughs> sorry for the confusion. <laughs> 